Okay, while you're being seated, I want to thank our sponsors again who make this possible. We're grateful to Microsoft, to Smead Capital Management right down here, to our friends at Launch. Uh, if you saw there, I'd encourage you to visit their table out front. Real Estate Transition Solutions, the MJ Murdoch Trust, Madrona, Eagle Publishing, Trilogy Partners, Enrix, and a host of uh, individual sponsors, uh, Roger and Leslie Bolin, uh, Dan and Cindy Mader, and Byron and Joanne Nutley. But there's another uh, special person here from Texas, and by the way, while I'm mentioning Texas, how about those Texas Rangers, am I right? Yeah, I know, I know. I, my joke about it was that uh, I'm looking forward to my 100th birthday when the Mariners win their first World Series. That, that will be in 2072, so mark your calendars. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, Brad Britton is here from Dallas, and he, uh, you, some of you remember that there was a matching offer, and Brad generously uh, donated to that campaign to help underwrite the work of the uh, Bradley Center and also this conference. So can we give our sponsors a round of applause, please? And then one more hat tip to our AV team. Uh, first of all, Rain On Me Productions is the crew back there. They're running everything. They make everything happen. So can we give them a round of applause? <clears throat> and then uh, Nate Jacobson, who you heard from yesterday, uh, designed these backdrops. I mean, is there anything cooler than that? I don't think so. Uh, so with that, uh, we have a great luncheon keynote. I, had the fortune, good fortune, a couple of weeks ago of being on an hour-long Zoom with uh, Michael Milken, our next speaker, and George Gilder, and my head was about to explode after uh, one hour. Uh, I learned so much, so I know you're going to learn a lot, too. It's going to be an hour session, and George Gilder is going to come up and introduce Michael. Well, we've had a lot of history passed through the chasm this year. And, uh, but in my view, the greatest redemption story, <coughs> story in the history of America is Michael Milken. Mike, Mike Milken, uh, I met 40, 50 years ago, and uh, he, was, he had launched the high-yield market and he was so far ahead of his time, so visionary that the legal processes in America, Barron's, Mag Barron's Weekly, the Wall Street Journal, all these publications couldn't imagine imagined that what his system was, was somehow a Ponzi scheme. Well, we, can, we got the answers today, folks. Uh, the companies that, the 7,000 companies that uh, Milken launched and financed and guided are now worth close to a trillion dollars. The high yield market that he invented is now worth five trillion dollars around the world, and trillion still does have a significant uh, weight. And uh, the and he's gone beyond uh, this uh, after the high yield triumph, which really is unprecedented in the history of our economy. He went went on after a terrible ordeal that few Americans have ever undergone. He then uh, emerged into uh, the, one of the nation's leading philanthropist by many measures and uh, the greatest conferences and the Milken Institute, the uh, educational efforts, the uh, all and his books, including the one Faster Cures, which is high yield, comes to medicine and cancer and, and all these other fields. So um, this is 
Mike represents the triumph of the human spirit, of human creativity against all obstacles, and the triumph of the entrepreneurial imagination. I give you Mike Milken. So George, that was uh, quite an introduction. And yes, we've known each other for many decades and our best years are still in front of us, George. So I thought and I talked today and then we'd have a conversation, but since the Discovery Institute plays such a large role, I thought I would start with this quote from Marcel Proust. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeing new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And so I thought what I would do today is cover a few topics, starting with three, of looking at the world maybe differently, the same world that you've lived in, and really stressing the importance of access to capital. So I was, I'm the oldest of the baby boomers. The first year the baby boomers went to college was 1964. I chose to go to Berkeley. My goal was to run the space program, uh, but President Eisenhower turned me down in 1957 when I was 11 years old uh, to run the space program. So that's why I chose to go to Berkeley. But this was, as I said, the very first year the baby boomers went to college. Those uh, born in 1946, and our parents told us that one person can change the world, and college campuses began to change at that period of time. But my goal of running the space program ended uh, on August 11, 1965, with the Watts riots in Los Angeles. Uh, you did not have to go to Vietnam. There were armed personnel carriers on the street of Los Angeles, and the city was on fire. And I met a young African-American man who told me his father would not, couldn't get a loan. He would never have access to capital because of the color of his skin. So I went back to Berkeley and scribbled down this formula in 1965, essentially the concept that prosperity job creation needs access to financial capital, all forms of financial capital, to serve as a multiplier on the world's largest asset that George has written about and spoken about, and that's the ability of individuals, their knowledge, human capital. And uh, Gary Becker won a Nobel Prize in 92 for this concept that somewhere between 75% and 90% of all the value of assets is the productivity of individuals. It is estimated conservatively today that the human capital quantitative measurement in the United States would be around 1,500 trillion. But it was my view in studying that we needed to provide access to capital for individuals to put their ideas in the motion. The second largest asset is social capital. And the asset that you see on balance sheets, cash, accounts receivable, inventories, makes up a very small part of the real assets of any country. And so as I looked at this issue, uh, I started studying credit in 65 at Berkeley. And I was 19 years old, and the, within three months, my conclusion was every single thing that the head of the Federal Reserve and the Secretary of the Treasury and everything you were taught in school was wrong. And all you had to do was look at the facts. There was a book written by a man named Heckman. He studied every single bond issued from 1900 to 1944 through the Depression and it showed what were the best credits, what were the worst, what was the highest rate of return. And during the Depression, the highest rate of return was still what we would call non-investment grade debt. 
There's about 500 companies today in America that are investment grade and about 15 million that aren't. And so the explosion of financial technologies that we focused on during this period of time, once you with ability had access to capital, you could see what occurred in the last 30 years of the 20th century, where 62 million jobs were created in the private sector by small and medium growing companies and minus four million were created by large companies once those companies had access to capital to compete. People that became legends, entrepreneurs that I had a chance to finance, of the thousand of them became household names. And I thought, with we're here and this subjects today, I'd start with Bill McGowan. So when I first met Bill McGowan, he had about 30 employees. George had written about fiber optics at the time. AT&T had 1.4 million employees, uh, but Bill's challenge was, would anyone loan him money? And if you loan money to MCI, you were blackballed by the world's largest payer of fees, AT&T. But it was only three years after we began to provide capital to Bill that AT&T was broken up. And the cost of a long distance call, many of you in the audience might not remember, but it was $12 a minute uh, when salaries were $100 a week. So not a lot of people were making long distance calls. Today, with technology, they're down to zero. There was another revolution that occurred about three or four years ago, and that was eventually what I saw as the same effort of MCI to revolutionize telecom as we know it, and that was the combination of a com company called Sprint that was starved for capital, but had capacity with T-Mobile. And this is the performance if you look at T-Mobile with the combination of Sprint versus AT&T and Verizon, and the merger of an extremely aggressive company, now that had the largest uh, spectrum of T-Mobile, caused Verizon and AT&T to eventually have to compete. And as you've seen over the last three to four years, as a result, they had to sell almost all the acquisitions they made, and so AT&T sold direct, at and sold Time Warner, Verizon sold AOL, Yahoo, and so on. But this is what happens when you have aggressive people with new ideas getting access to capital. But we're here in Seattle, and I see a few of you might be as old as I am and might remember this sign in Seattle. And this sent was, will the last person leaving Seattle please turn out the lights? And why was this occurring? A company which we had financed, Boeing, decided to move its headquarters and reduced its employment in six years by 60%. But Seattle never missed a beat, greatly due to four entrepreneurs that chose to live in this city. Bill Gates and Paul Allen, Howard Schultz, Craig McCaw, and Jeff Bezos. And so they didn't have to turn the lights on in Seattle. Seattle turned the lights on, and, uh, and it's dramatically different today. But I want to come back again to one of those four individuals, Craig McCaw. So AT&T invented, and this isn't your AT&T today because AT&T is really Southwest Bell that acquired AT&T, but AT&T developed the technology for mobile. And they had a report and they brought McKinsey in at the end of the 1970s. And the McKinsey report said that by the year 2000, there would be 900,000 users of cell phones on the planet. And so AT&T did not decide at that time not to go into the industry they invented. 
Well, they were a little off on their projections, as you all know, and by the year 2000, they were selling 900,000 a day at one point uh, at that time. And so today there are slightly more mobile phones on the planet than humans, over 8 billion of them. And this young man in Seattle, Craig McCall, that I had an opportunity to visit, no one would loan him money for his crazy idea of investing in mobile technology. But over time, uh, we became friends, and by the middle of the 80s, finance Craig, and he was the driving force in the mobile industry during that period of time. And by 93 and 94, AT&T decided to get back into the mobile industry and acquired a McCall Cellular company. If you look at per capita income in the Seattle area due to just a handful of entrepreneurs who changed the world, you'll see that it's among the highest in the United States and substantially above, substantially above the per capita income in the country. So access to capital combined with what George would tell you is the most scarce resource, the ability and knowledge of people, changed the world and it changed this part of the country. What about medical, health, et cetera? So, I'm sure you're not thinking about it unless you've gone to a Milken Institute conference in the last 30 plus years, but the number one driver of the economy in the last 200 years is public health and medical research. Probably the greatest achievement of humankind has been the extension of life. And in four million years of evolution, Average life expectancy on this planet went from 20 to 31 years of age, and by 1900, at the start of the 20th century, average life expectancy on the planet was 31. So do markets affect bioscience industries? And so let's take a look at this fact. So I'm going to take you back 20 plus years to the year 2000. Shortly around the beginning of the internet crash and tech crash in America. And this is a look at, looking at at this time, 180 biotech companies in the United States versus Merck, which at that time was the most valuable pharmaceutical company in the world. And so, 180 public biotech companies combined were worth 150 billion. Merck was worth 175 billion. And so the world was moving to a de-risk standpoint. Access to capital was being denied. Now, these companies were working on 350 different clinical trials. Merck 25, they were spending eight billion a year on R&D, Merck, 1.8 billion. Their revenue was only two-thirds of Merck, and they were losing money. Well, how did it turn out later? Well, at that point in time, I just picked one company, Genentech. It took 11 Genentechs to make one Merck. If we look forward six years, this is just one of the 180 companies it took 1.1 Mercs to make one Genentech. What about the world today? The most valuable bioscience companies in the world today are Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk. They both probably added another 15 to 20 billion today uh, on their market cap. They dwarf the other companies in the industry due to new advances uh, on trying to control the most expensive part of the medical system, and that's related to weight. The change of weight in America in the last 30 years cost just the United States between one and a half and two trillion dollars a year. And so when you look at the enormous growth of these companies, and Eli Lilly, for example, you'll see the success 
of some of their products, not through acquisition, but through research, and the potential impact on Eli Lilly of eight other areas from kidney to stroke to heart attacks and the dramatic effect it will have. And so if you look at the power of health and financial markets, if you look at Nova Nordisk today, Nova Nordisk is worth more than the GDP of the country that it's headquartered in, uh, Denmark. And you'll see today that the largest foundation in the world is now the Nova Nordisk Foundation. It is not the Gates Foundation. And when Nova Nordisk announced that the other benefit of their drug for weight control, diabetes control, might affect kidney and the need for kidney dialysis, the number one transplant uh, of any organ is kidneys. You can see the day that they announced this, that it might affect and keep your kidneys healthy, your con kidney dialysis companies went down 10 to 20 percent in, in just one day. So as you look at the foundations and how they have been changed, if we look at the 10 largest foundations in the world today, Looking at the world differently, you'll see the largest is Nova Nordisk. Gates here in Seattle is second. The third largest is Wellcome Trust, MasterCard, etc. Eli Lilly Foundation that holds Eli Lilly stock, and Hughes. <clears throat> Four of the five largest foundations in the world today, collectively that could be about 10 to 20 billion a year in research, our medical foundation, and obviously by far the largest focus of the Gates Foundation, which would make five, is in medical. And does today look like 2000? In many ways it did. So in November of 21, or during 2021, if you took a high school biology course, you could take a biotech company public based on that resume. Today, if you have four Nobel Prize winners on your board, you might not be able to go public. And if you look at the charts of whether it's Ginkgo Bioworks or Lyle or Oscar or so on, or you can see the average stock in two years is off 80 to 90 percent. And many of them have negative enterprise value. A company like Oscar has over three billion in cash and has a negative market cap of uh, enterprise value of minus two billion. So the equity and the value of the company is substantially less than the cash. When you go to school, what do you study if you're getting an MBA? They teach you a number of things, and this is a financing cube, which I wrote down in 1968. And what do you learn? Let's, first, you need to understand the company. In the case of the example of Macaw or MCI, they were competing with much larger companies, so you needed to have liquidity on your balance sheets. Next, what about the industry? What are the future of that industry? Then you learn about capital markets and the economy. And you learn that the worst time to finance is when you need money, and the best time to finance is when you don't need money. And that's basically what you learn in the school. But the two potentially most important factors are regulation and society. What does society think about your business, your ideas, and Depending how it feels, you'll get regulation. So let's just look at one recent regulation. The impact of the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA. So what about the length of this? I have a feeling no one has ever read all the pages. So if we look at the Declaration of Independence, six pages, if we look at the Inflation Reduction Act, 750 pages, 
which is longer than the Bible, the Old Testament, the Koran, etc. What is the impact? So you would think, okay, the industry mobilized. Large pharma shut down manufacturing plants to manufacture a competitive product. The U.S. government put up 20 to 30 billion to build plants before you knew if the product worked and to manufacture antivirals and vaccines before you knew it worked but in an economic cost just in the United States of a trillion dollars a month, it was a drop in the bucket. So you would think, okay, we're gonna thank this industry for what they did. This is the government's thank you. So you can see the impact on this is a dramatic change in the revenues of this industry going forward. And if you couple this with the projection of FDA approval of new products and service, it is now projected that this act will reduce by 40% or more new innovation in the bioscience industry, revenue losses and job losses, starting with the state of California. And you can see what is now projected in this industry that saved the world. And lastly, this is coupled with a number of the drugs coming off patent uh, in the next period of time. And this is an easy reason to understand why Nova Nordis and Eli Lilly today are the most valuable, as many of their competitors' major drugs are coming off. Faster cures. <clears throat> I was interested in listening to the presentations earlier today. <clears throat> the former head of AstraZeneca who today is the CEO of the largest medical company in the U.S., United Healthcare, pointed out if we had discovered electricity prior to fermentation, we would have never had chemotherapy. But as the ability to communicate with every cell in your body what the potential is. And so many years ago, we formed an organization called Faster Cures. And it was very interesting. We saw science that you exposed today to the group moving like a train. A train today, not in the United States, but in other countries, can travel as much as 220 miles an hour. And so what about the US? And it's the regulation and infrastructure that's the tracks. So the average train in the United States travels at the same speed it did 100 years ago. So if you think of the train as science, it is slowed down by tracks, i.e. regulation, infrastructure, ways of approaching things that do not like science to move forward. As we think about COVID and the technology available today, it was only 63 days 63 days before the first human being was given a vaccine after the sequencing of the DNA. And so it faster cures what we tried to create was the central information source, which was monitoring over 500 vaccines and antivirals. It was 30 plus years ago that we began to focus on many of the technologies that I've heard mentioned here this morning. In fact, we focused on 17 of them that time, including this concept of immunology. However, we were unable to increase government funding in the country for almost 20 years for the number one driver of the world's economy. So we planned this march in 98. The march focused on cancer because people were scared. Two months later, President Clinton signed into law a doubling of the NIH budget and unjusted for inflation, $500 billion in incremental funding has come out for basic research at the NIH. But there was a change that was needed and we brought 80 to 90 of the world's leading change makers. Our only omission was George Gilder at that time. Together, 
And the conclusion was we needed to create a new center, a center called the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. So we had basic science being funded and moving along. We had clinical, but it was in the middle translational that was slowing down the train. And so we put on this event called the Celebration of Science, Young Scientists, and the US government uh, committed five to six billion dollars within two months to this effort. I want to come back to Seattle once again for you. And so as we looked at the medical care in this country, what we discovered was that we did not have equal access. So we picked the first group, and the first group were those that served the country in the military, those that were in the VA, and we started right here in Puget Sound VA. And the idea was if you served the United States, you would get equal cancer care. And so if you enrolled in the VA and the Seattle area, you were simultaneously enrolled at uh, University of Washington and Fred Hutch. And what we discovered within a short period of time was we were able to reduce the death rate, particularly of African Americans from cancer, in this case prostate cancer, by 50%. Unfortunately, the only place in America today where African Americans have the same death rate as the general population is in the VA. And then we've taken this idea so far out to 1.2 million patients in just five years of different focus on care. The other example that I would give you is the average age that an individual gets funding from the NIH is around 43 years of age. If you look at almost all Nobel Prize winners, they might get a Nobel Prize at 60, they might be discovered by George's daughter and get a Nobel Prize this year. Or, but most of the ideas occurred within five years of being in school. And when you talk about technology today, the students coming out of school are much better equipped to deal with the availability of AI and other technologies today. And so over the years, we have now funded more than 500 young people in their early 30s by giving them their own laboratories throughout the world. And more than 40% of every discovery in the last 20 years has come from this group of people in bioscience. Okay. So I see the program is so concentrated on AI. I have to talk for a moment about AI before I stop. So how has technology affected how we treat patients? Well, let's start with just one of our areas. One of our foundation is the Melanoma Research Alliance that's under Faster Cures. And you, if you could have your pathologist degree, you could get six of them, but rarely do you get over 60% agreement. And so technology today, there is no pathologist in the world today in the field of melanoma who can do what a computer can do. So here's a little AI video on melanoma. AI and robotics are making advances across the healthcare industry, from genetic testing and robotic surgery to cancer research and data collection. Soon enough, you may even run into some AI in the exam room. Finding the melanoma is like trying to find the needle in the stack of needles. Dermatologist Roberto Novoa is using an AI algorithm to help identify skin cancer. It's basically comparing that lesion to the hundreds of thousands of other lesions that it's looked at. The technology is an experimental mobile version of an algorithm that was modified by a team of Stanford grad students. What we've built here is an algorithm that, using a single picture, can distinguish between benign and malignant skin conditions. AI expert Sebastian Thrun led their team. So what this can do is it can bring diagnosis to your home. Just take out your phone, take a little image, 
and get as good a diagnostics as you would get if you go to the doctor. So how did they do it? Oddly enough, it all started with dogs. Thousands and thousands of them. The way we train these algorithms is we show them many, many example cases from a particular object class. So for instance, in the case of dogs, we'd show lots of examples of dogs. And then we would test it and understand how effective it is at recognizing dogs by showing it new examples that it's never seen before. A couple of dermatologists approached us and they said, listen, if artificial intelligence can distinguish between hundreds of breeds of dogs, it might be able to do something for skin conditions. In a test, the algorithm matched the performance of 21 board-certified dermatologists. It was also much faster, scanning skin images at about 200 times the rate of a human. With sufficient data, I think that they will outperform the majority of humans. So today, almost 500,000 melanomas have been recorded. There is no human being that's ever seen that many as you can scan. And it's just the beginning, as many of you know, of what the potential is. The book that George wrote, I felt that every single speaker had a book, so I had to write a book and get it here in a hurry. <laughs> it's not easy to write a book. You know, I, when I thought about it, I'm kind of like I Love Lucy, Lucille Ball in that old episode where chocolate's coming down the line uh, and it's coming faster than she can put in the... But the world changes and the ability to stay still. I'm still in awe of the Gilder family ability to pump out books here today. But I, uh, I wrote this book really for one reason. We are on the verge of a complete revolution in healthcare, cost of healthcare, et cetera. And what the government and pharma did during COVID, where everything was mobilized around the world, accelerated into months what would have been years or decades. And the problem is once you feel you've solved an issue, you stop focusing and won't focus on the next crisis. And, and my point was it was time to step harder on the accelerator and not the brake. And that was why I wrote this book. And I conclude the last chapter in this book on a visit to the Melanoma Research Alliance event in New York. Three young men in their 30s and 40s were diagnosed with melanoma. By the time it was diagnosed, it had metastasized on their brain, their liver, and their lungs. Normal life expectancy at that point was 30 to 60 days. But the checkpoint inhibitors, the work done by Jim Allison that we began to fund in 97, changed the course of history. All three of them, within a few months, were in total remission and living normal lives today. And so as I see the challenges of the world, once you see them clearly, my view is run towards the hardest problems. Uh, you learn a lot more when you're trying to figure out how to deal with the hardest problems, not the easiest ones. And it changes time from that standpoint. So thank you. So, Mike, you've since moved on to the hardest problem. And that, I believe, is demography. I mean, uh, you know, people are human beings are forgetting how to reproduce. And uh, this has consequences all around the world. Uh, what are your views on this? this global challenge. I mean, this, there won't be any South Koreans in, in uh, 100 years at the current rate, not because the North Korea has a bomb, but because South Korea uh, has a, a pandemic of uh, childlessness. Uh, what, what's your... Uh, so I think, George, one of the questions is, when do you see change? 
This weekend, the New York, New York Times just discovered to tell you that the growth of the world's population is in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, you could have seen that 20 years ago, not today. So when do you see the change? Now, what we know is three things. One, as per capita income goes up, the birth rate goes down. As women get educated, the birth rate goes down. And so as you talk about Korea after the war, at the peak, the average woman that had a baby had seven children. Today, half the women in South Korea do not plan to have any children. And the birth rate projected is around 0 0.75, 0 0.78 today. There will always be a South Korea. They might come from other parts of the world. So we see this issue occurring, and it's not just South Korea. So the whole world, in many ways, has been driven by the Northern Hemisphere. And in this century, the world is increasingly going to be driven by the Southern Hemisphere. So we have shifted in the last four or five years to do cancer research here in Sub-Saharan Africa in five countries to try to gather more. But if you look at China today, the birth number of children born in China has gone down by 60%, 60%. They used to have 25 million kids born a year, and if you look at 2022, you'll see it's nine and a half million kids. Now, you can project uh, average life expectancy of 80, that, that would probably be more than it's going to be. Uh, that would take you to under 800 million people in China in the, in the next 100 years. They would lose 600 million people in their population. Probably not a good idea to be investing in a lot of real estate uh, in that area. But Nigeria, uh, here's a look here at the number of people that die versus the number of people that are born. And the United States is right on the verge of going negative at this time. And in fact, there'd be no increase in the US population in the last 60 years if it wasn't for immigration. So the US has an enormous advantage that people want to come here. We estimate 800 million people want to come to the U.S. We just make it extremely difficult if you're talented. And if you look at Canada, if you haven't been focused, they've increased their population by 35 to 40 percent using a point system of do you speak English, do you speak French, uh, are you educated, do you have a skill, do you have money for investing? And so the U.S. It's amazing what we could accomplish. If a billion people came to the US, we would be less densely populated than India today. But when you talk about these countries and look at where the children are today, there are 200 million more children in India than China. So thinking more children in India than China. And so for every child born in China, almost two and a half million of them are born in India. And so thinking about these countries the same way, uh, India is a country who has to deal with creation of tens of millions of new jobs. China, a working age population is already peaked. They now have the most number of people with diabetes in the world due to 20,000 fast food restaurants that have hit China. They have the most number of people with cancer, and they will eventually have more people over 65 than live in the US. And I just think, keeping with this theme of seeing the world with new eyes, let's just look, George, maybe at Nigeria for a moment. Okay. So the US is 10 times the size of Nigeria on square footage, square miles. Okay, now if we look at the population at the moment, the US population is one and a half times Nigeria. Now, let's go look at the birth rate. 
So the birth rate is three and a quarter times in Nigeria, the US, and today there's 20 million more children in Nigeria than the US, and my friends tell me and that live in Nigeria, there's more entrepreneurs in Nigeria than here. And so I think the first issue is that 19 of the 20 countries with the highest birth rate are in Sub-Saharan Africa. The only one which you could guess, which is Afghanistan, uh, that's not in Sub-Saharan Africa. Obviously, when you look at Nigeria, it's number 10 in birth rate. There's many that are going to grow a lot faster than Nigeria. And so it's been our feeling is they might not be in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are more people in the United States today that were born in Sub-Saharan Africa than were born in Europe. And so as you look at the change in the United States, 60 years ago, 75% of everyone not born in the United States was born in Europe and 10% in Canada. Today, more than 70% of everyone not born here was from Latin America and Asia. But once again, as you can see here, there are substantially more people who were born in Sub-Saharan Africa than we're born in Europe now. And I would suggest that if we don't create opportunities in Africa, uh, they will be here. And one of the highest performing academic groups in the United States uh, is Nigerians. So I don't think people are focused really on the dramatic change in demographics. For every child born in all of North America, Mexico, United States, and Canada, if there's 100 kids born, there's 125 born in Nigeria. For every child born from Ireland to the east coast of Russia, for every 100, there's 125 born. And for every child born in Latin America, South America, every 100, you have 125 or 140 born. That's, and this is only one of 20 countries today. And they, there are 84% penetration of mobile phones in Sub-Saharan Africa today, up from four. They can see the world today, and if there's a better world for their children, they're going to be on the move. How do we revive the American dream so we can uh, uh, look at the future with more optimi optimism and vision? As I mean, you, how do we have a new high-yield America? Well, uh, as you know, George, I personally became very concerned about this about 12 or 14 years ago, and we've spent the last 10 years building this center across from the White House and the Treasury. We bought every building uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue there that wasn't a federal building to create this center for advancing the American dream. And we have now filmed two to 3,000 people on the way to five, th five when we open and eventually 10. And I would say to you, the American dream is alive and well. Unfortunately, in this country, we've had a lot of misinformation put out. And so if you look in the world, we've been doing these surveys for 10 years now. If you say to me, what country in the world believes in this concept, an American dream, what is it? It's upward mobility based not who your parents were, your religion, your sex, where you were born, where you went to school. That's what it is. Uh, Probably the number one country that believes in it today is a communist country called Vietnam. That's right. Somewhere around 90 to 95 percent believe in it. They have a very favorable view of the United States. Every single person seems like they're an entrepreneur in this communist right. country. It's South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, parts of the Middle East. Uh, they all believe Mexico, teenagers in Mexico, 
I'm guessing 70 to 80 percent, depending what you ask, believe their life is going to be better today. You might not think that when you read about Mexico. And when we survey people, what is your American dream, the thousands of them around the world? The same answer has come back every year, George. Freedom of choice. Freedom to live your life. A good family life. And personal wealth ranks the lowest. Yeah. So, yes, the American dream, unfortunately, uh, upward mobility is often affected by the zip code you're born in. And so the southeast, rising from the lowest to the highest, is probably the least probability. Uh, you'd be surprised, but large parts of the Midwest have the highest probability of rising from the poorest to the wealthiest groups in their lifetime. And so we've been filming. We filmed people whose ancestors did not come here by choice but as slaves. We filmed people who lived in homeless shelters, never knew who their father was. We just filmed recently this man, Freddie Fingers. This is Milken Institute, what American Dream Project. Yes, 10,000. We're investing 50 million recording individuals so we can learn from them so you hopefully can find someone like you. No matter what your disadvantages, no matter how difficult your life was, was there someone like you that rose up? And uh, a lot of people in this country don't fully recognize how people from Ireland were discriminated against when they first yeah. came here. The firm that I work for, one out of every three directors at Drexel quit when they merged with J.P. Morgan because they didn't want to be associated with an Irishman. So <laughs> there are a lot of changes that have occurred uh, at this time. And I would say to you, our goal is to build a symbol of hope here. And in many ways, that's what this conference is about, using technology. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you that, that was a great session, and uh, you may have... Now he, we're he, doing he, graphene. <laughs> you know George, yes. George is all about graphene, so I guess learning. we're going on to the graphene I'm panel.